Today in our study of Scottish church history, we're going to look at 1640 to 1643. We're going to talk about the events leading to the Psalm League and Covenant. And we're going to have an analysis of the Psalm League and Covenant, uh, at least about half of it. I didn't, I didn't finish it. I'm going to go into quite a bit of detail on events leading to the Psalm League and Covenant, because if you don't go understand the, how that occurred, the Psalm League and Covenant's not going to make a lot of sense. So we're going to talk about a lot of history. We begin in 1640. The king hated the actions of the General Assembly and the Scottish Parliament. He believed that they were unconstitutional and more than unlawful. Charles held that he possessed, by virtue of his position as king, the power of altering the constitution of both church and state according to his arbitrary will. And if you, you know your history, this is the divine right of king's doctrine, and he held to that. Under absolute orders from the king, Tranquihar, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, endeavored to prevail upon the parliament to amend the errors which had been permitted to pass the assembly. Now I'm saying errors in the mind of the king. Tranquar, it's Q-U-I-R, I don't know how to pronounce that, Tranquar, hastened to the court in order to attempt to soothe the king's wrath. In 1640, the Scottish Parliament sent the earls of Ladoon and Dunfermline to London for a similar purpose. After listening to the Earl of Ladoon give the message he was uh, sent to make, the king had him placed in the Tower of London and commanded that he be beheaded by 9 a.m. the next morning. You think Hillary's bad? This guy's pretty bad. This command was told to the Marquis of Hamilton by the lieutenant of the tower. The Marquis of Hamilton went to the king immediately and convinced him to relent on the basis of the outrage it would cause in Scotland. The king, who we have seen, was a tyrannical fool, was fully resolved to go to war with the Covenanters. <clears throat> the only major difficulty in his way was the fact that raising, equipping, and paying a large army would be very expensive. And we need to keep in mind that in prior centuries, the civil government could not simply print money as they do today. Uh, they needed real gold, they needed real silver. They had to raise gold and silver, and this would take the cooperation of the Parliament of England. Eleven years had elapsed since the last English Parliament. During these eleven years, there, there had been many tyrannical barbarous cruelties committed by Charles and the Star Chamber. Consequently, Charles dreaded the idea of calling a parliament because he feared that instead of granting new revenues, it may instead proceed first to a consideration of grievances against the crown. This, in fact, is essentially what took place. When the parliament did meet, <clears throat> they would not listen to the king's plea for money until they aired their own grievances into the many wrongs done to them and sought some uh, kind of redress to the problems raised. This, therefore, was a very short parliament because the king dissolved it. It ran, uh, it's called the short parliament in history and it met from April to May, 1640. <clears throat> the short parliament was not of a revolutionary temper and though under John Pym's leadership, it refused supply to the king's army, armies until grievances were redressed. Charles might perhaps have rallied substantial support, even in the commons, by patient and reasonable concessions. Instead, he just hastily dissolved the parliament. Opinion now turned sharply against him. He could raise little money and no effective army. So he then set to the raising of money, the necessary funds, by every means possible within his power without Parliament. By exceptional efforts, money was raised and 19,000 foot shoulders and 20,000 cavalry were the result. This resulted in, in a Scottish army that crossed into England. Okay, you know you're about to be attacked, you take the offensive. The result was that for a time the king backed down. A treaty was arranged which took, uh, 
it took from late 1640 to August 1641 to conclude. The Scots occupied Northumberland and Durham, and a great council of peer, peers produced a, only a treaty with the Scots, which committed Charles to pay them 25,000 pounds sterling a month until a final settlement. This made another parliament unavoidable. So you see the Scots had the upper hand. So the king dissolved Parliament. All the members were sent home. He then set himself with the goal of raising money. He got the soldiers. They were uh, the Scottish army crossed into England, took a bunch of land. In the meantime, when they were trying to resolve a treaty, the Scottish commissioners were sent to London to help with a treaty consisting of Henderson, Bailey, Blair, and Gillespie. In July of 1641, these men returned to Scotland for the General Assembly. Following out the idea that had been suggested by the commissioners in London, Henderson proposed to the assembly the propriety of framing a full and systematic scheme of all things required in a regularly constituted church, namely a confession of faith, a catechism, a directory for all parts of the public worship of God. Okay, this is 1641. The assembly not only admitted the desirableness of such a measure, but assigned the task of executing it to Henderson himself, permitting him to retire to, from his pastoral duties that he might devote his whole time and strength to the discharge of so important a duty, and empowering him to call to his assistance such of his brethren as he knew to be most highly qualified. So this is the small beginning of what would become the Westminster Standards. I bring it up because in God's providence, just a few years later, you know, it set the stage for the Psalm League and Covenant um, it, well, for the Westminster Standards. So they were going to do something similar to the Westminster Standards, even apart from what took place providentially. Well, let's look now at the Long Parliament. I'm setting the stage for the Psalm League and Covenant. And if you, I just find books, they jump right into the Psalm League and Covenant. You know, well, why did they come about? Well, it came about because of the situation. With the Scots at Newcastle to be paid with London merchants refusing loans to the king and the London mob rioting against the bishops, the new parliament held the whip hand. In the next nine months, it brought down the king's chief advisor, swept away most of the machinery of conciliar government and made frequent parliaments a statutory, statutory necessity. Stafford was condemned by an act of attainder after the evidence against him proved inadequate for impeachment. And Charles, in fear of the mob, consented um, Oh, to his ex execution, that's Stafford, May 1641. These are all big shots of the king that were oppressing the people in the church, the Puritans. Laud was impeached and imprisoned while the Lord Keeper, Lord Finch, and the Secretary of State, Sir Francis Wildebank, fled overseas. The courts of the Star Chamber and High Commission and the Council of the North were abolished. The Council in the Welsh Marshes lost its extraordinary jurisdiction. Persons arrested by the Privy Council were to have the legality of their com commitment decided within three days by common law courts. The Triennial Act provided for a parliament every three years, even if the king failed to summon one. And another act forbade the dissolution of the present parliament without its own consent. Okay, these are all, you notice, these are all things done against tyranny. They were fed up with law. They were fed up with the king. They were fed up with the star chamber. They were fed up with the king's uh, henchmen. The levying of tonnage and poundage and impositions without parliamentary consent were made illegal. The ship money judgment was reversed, knighthood's fines abolished, and the boundaries of the royal forest limited. So far, except over Stafford's attainder, there had been unanimity in the commons and between the commons and the lords. In the summer of 1641, however, division began to appear. Some like Edward Hyde, later the Earl of Clarendon, and Viscount Falkland began to feel that enough had been done. Others, like John Pym, He's the head of parliament. And John Hampton did not trust Charles until they were, had wrestled control of the executive from him. <coughs> Religion widened and embittered the split. The first group, fearing the growing influence and wildness of the more extreme Puritan sects, rallied to the Episcopal Church. The second, alarmed by many plots in the Roman Catholic Queen's influence, were driven into alliance 
with root and branch Puritan reformers and alienated the Lords by seeking to exclude bishops from the upper house. You gotta remember that England was not as reformed as Scotland at this point. Then came the Catholic rebellion in Ireland, which happened in October. An army was needed to suppress it. But to raise armies and appoint commanders uh, was a royal prerogative, which Pym and his friends declared not let Charles exercise. Their attempt to seize sovereign power in its most obvious form, control of the armed forces, turned into turned their Episcopalian opponents into a royalist party. You know, I'm leading up to the, there's going to be a civil war. And this is going to lead to the Solomon Covenant. Knowing after the experience of 1629 to 40 that they would be helpless unless they could identify themselves with Parliament, or at least with the House of Commons, they forced through the grammar remonstrance in November. This recited all the alleged misdeeds of Charles' reign and demanded that the king's ministers be appointed with the approval of Parliament. Kind of like in the United States today. The president appoints people and they have to be approved by the Congress. And the church reformed by Parliament in consultation with an assembly of divines. Okay, this is going to lead to the Solemn League and Covenant. That it was carried by only 11 votes in a house barely two-thirds full shows how precarious Pym's position was. Had Charles been content to sit still, the royalists might soon have gained the upper hand, but Charles, fearing for his queen, tried personally to arrest five members of parliament, Pym, Hamden, Denzel, Hollis, and Sir Arthur Hesbridge, and William Stowed. Stowed. This is January 1642. His rash and abortive attempt appeal to force enabled his opponents to keep their majority to begin to organize themselves as a rival government and to raise troops by ordinance. Charles, after sending the queen abroad, retired to York, then following an exchange of manifestos, ended with the 19 propositions, June 1642, which repeated the Grand Remonstrance demands and claimed also parliamentary control of the armed forces. Charles naturally rejected this, and on August 22, 1642, raised his standard at Nottingham. He's gonna to go to war. The Civil War had begun. This is critical. This is going to lead to an alliance with the Scots. For many months, the king had the upper hand, but almost took London. By the end of 1643, the king held much of west of, west of England. This area, however, was more backward and less populated. As time passed, the parliamentary forces gained more strength as they mobilized. Counties in the east, counties in the east formed an association in Oliver Cromwell, developed a body of horsemen to offset the superiority of the royalist cavalry. Okay, here's little Cromwell. He's not even a warrior. And he decides to help out. And he'll become the greatest military strategist almost in history. He's the only person I know. <clears throat> he never lost a battle his entire career. He never lost one battle. There were setbacks in 1643 which drove Parliament to call upon the Scots. Here's what J.G. Voss says. In August 1643, the Parliament of England proposed to the Estates of Scotland and also to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland that Scotland enter into a reciprocal military union with a parliamentary party in England. The Church of Scotland, however, preferred a religious bond to a military or civil union. The result was the drafting of the Solemn League and Covenant. The document was prepared by Alexander Henderson, and on the 17th of August 1643, it was approved by the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland after which it was sent to England, where, after slight changes, it was publicly sworn and afterwards subscribed by the House of Commons and the Westminster Assembly in a joint meeting. After this, the Psalm League and Covenant was returned to Scotland, where it was sworn and subscribed by the Commission of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland and the Committee of the Convention of the States of the Parliament of Scotland. Later, it was sworn and subscribed with great unanimity by all classes of people throughout Scotland, except those who favored prelacy in the Church and absolutism in the state. End of quote. The English Parliament gained much by this league, or covenant, which promised to extirpate prelacy and popery and establish a truly reformed church in England. The Scots got what they wanted, a religious covenant. The English got what they wanted, a civil or military alliance. Parliament gained by this as much as Charles lost by a cessation or armistice with Roman Catholic Ireland. The Scots joined Sir Thomas Fairfax's Yorkshire men and Cromwell, Cromwell's troops to clear the north by routing Prince Rupert and the Marquis of Newcastle at Marston Moor, July 1644. 
But the king saved the southwest by forcing the army of the Earl of Essex to capitulate at Lostwithdale in September. So Parliament passed the self-denying ordinance, which made poss possible sweeping changes in command and created an effective field force in the new model army. You have to understand, in the old days, people would serve in leadership positions in the army due to their position as princes or lords, not on the basis of competency and quality. And if you've studied, if you've ever studied the uh, the fight against Islam in the Middle Ages, uh, the uh, the great problem <clears throat> for the Christian forces and I, I, the Romanist forces, or we say Christian with quotation marks, was they had incompetent leadership, as where the Muslims had very good, excellent leadership because it was all done by who was the best qualified, as were the uh, Christian forces, the Roman Catholic forces. It was your position as Lord that gave you leadership. And that's why they suffered many defeats under the Muslims. Well, that's the same situation here. Under Fairfax and Cromwell, this army won the Midlands by its victory at Nasby, June 1645. Then after subduing the Southwest, it ended the war by capturing the royal headquarters at Oxford, June 1646, where Charles had fled to seek refuge with the Scottish army. Parliament thus achieved victory through the agency of the Scots and the new model army. Its two agents, however, had their own ideas about a settlement. The Scots were soon satisfied by Parliament's Newcastle propositions in August, demanding parliamentary control of the militia, punishment of the king's chief supporters, and the establishment of Presbyterianism. When Charles refused these terms and Parliament offered 400,000 pounds sterling to reward its expenses, the Scottish army handed him over and marched home in January 1647. That's an incredible amount of money. The English army was less easily satisfied. In it, and especially in the cavalry, a wide variety of independent sects flourished, bound together by dislike of uniformity, whether Presbyterian or Anglican. This whole army, the whole army soon joined these sects in opposition with, when Parliament decided to send some regiments to Ireland to disband others and to impose the covenant on all, without offering either an adequate indemnity for past actions or satisfactory security for the larger arrears of pay. The soldiers refused to disband. They seized the king in June, and strongly influenced by the democratic ideas of John Lyburn and the levelers, those agitators or agents, to join with the officers in a general council of the army. Now, as you all know, this would end up with Cromwell becoming the Lord Protector. He, Cromwell would become almost a dictator. And Cromwell would be a disaster for the cause of the covenant and true religion in England. He was essentially a pluralist and even allowed heretical sects to flourish. He was, however, far better than Charles II would be. You know, Charles is not a friend to Reformation. I mean, excuse me, Cromwell was not a friend to Reformation, although I do believe he was a Christian. Regarding the Psalm League and Covenant, here's what David Lockman writes. I, just, I had to introduce the events that led to the Psalm League and Covenant. Psalm League and Covenant, this is David Lockman, a religious co covenant and civil league between the Scots and the English, agreed and ratified mid-1643. In the context of a worsening military situation in England and fears that a royalist victory would threaten the reform religion and civil liberty in both countries, many desired closer cooperation. However, the Scottish Covenanters primarily wanted religious uniformity, whereas the English preferred civil and particularly military cooperation. As Robert Bailey expressed it, quote, the English were for a civil league, we were for a religious covenant. That's from Letters and Journals 290. <clears throat> but the British were willing to make concessions to obtain military aid. They extended an invitation to the Scots to send commissioners to the newly called Westminster Assembly and approved the draft of a league and covenant drawn up by Alexander Henderson. This was then approved by the General Assembly and the Convention of Estates, which was essentially acting on behalf of the Scottish Parliament. A treaty for sending an army to England and English pay was approved shortly afterward. <clears throat> the Psalm League and Covenant, as thus agreed, was first of all a religious covenant. After noting that they one king and one reformed religion, and expressing their concern about the estate of both church and kingdom in England and Scotland, the signatories swear to preserve the reformed religion in the Church of Scotland and the religion, reformation of religion in England and to bring the churches to, to quote, the nearest conjunction and uniformity in, uh, in religion. Confession, Government and worship. 
They also bound themselves to extirpate popery and prelacy as well as superstition, heresy, and whatever is contrary to sound doctrine. Only after these religious points did they proceed to the civil, binding themselves to preserve the rights and privileges of the parliaments and the liberties of the kingdoms and to preserve and defend the king's majesty's person and authority. To bring to trial all who hinder such reformation of religion or divide the king from his people and to continue such to all posterity and not suffer themselves to be withdrawn from this blessed union and conjunction. They desire to be humbled for their sins and look to God to turn away his wrath and strengthen them in their work. The English Parliament made some alterations to the draft before approving it, particularly in a desire to avoid a commitment to use the Scottish Presbyterian model in reforming the Church of England. They also included Ireland in a document which they previously referred to only Scotland and England. Yeah, that's an addition of the English. They wanted Ireland in there, which was essentially under the thumb of Britain. But the urgency of the situation overcame any further misgivings, both theirs and the Scots, on receiving an amended document. Though the English believed the door was left open for independency, the Scots were confident that reformation of religion, according to the word of God, involved Presbyterianism. And all looked for God to bless their armies with success in the continuing conflict. And just a note on the assembly, it was primarily Presbyterian, with a good-sized block of Puritan independents and some Erastians, not many. And that's why you see that the directory for church government is explicitly Presbyterian. Let's look at Hetherington's comments, and then I'll, I'll get into the thing myself. Quote, perhaps no, no great international transaction has ever been so much misrepresented and maligned as the Psalm League and Covenant. Even its defenders have often exposed it and its authors to severe censures by their unwise modes of defense. There can be no doubt in the mind of any intelligent and thoughtful man that it mainly rests under providence, the noble structure of the British Constitution. But for it, so far as man may judge, these kingdoms would have been placed beneath the deadening bondage of absolute despotism. And in the fate of Britain, the liberty and civilization of the world would have sustained a fatal paralyzing shock. This consideration alone might bid the statesman pause before he ventures to condemn the Psalm League and Covenant. But to the Christian, we may suggest still loftier thoughts. The great principles of that sacred bond are those of the Bible itself. It may be that Britain were not then, and is not yet, in a fit state to receive them and to make her, them her principles and rules of national government and law. But they are not on, on that account untrue, nor even impractical. And the glorious predictions of inspired scripture foretell a time when they shall be more than realized. And when all the kingdoms of this earth shall become the kingdoms of Jehovah and of his anointed. And all shall be united in one solemn league and covenant under the king, of, king and lord of lords. And though that time may yet still be far distant, who may presume to say that the seemingly premature and ineffectual attempt to realize it by the heavenly-minded patriarchs of Scotland's Second Reformation was not the first faint struggling day, day beam, piercing the world's thick darkness and revealing to the eye of faith an earnest of the rising sun of righteousness. True, the clouds soon darkened down and hid that herald day beam, but no less certainly does the day approach although its dawning hour be shaded in the deepest gloom. A sacred principle was then infused into the heart of nations, which cannot perish. A light then shone into the world's darkness, which cannot be extinguished. And generations not remote may see that principle quickening and evolving in all its irresistible might, and that light bursting forth in all its brightening glory. But we may not further pursue this line of thought, however attractive. But we must not further pursue this line of thought, however attractive. Another and less delightful course of reflection demands our notice. It has often been said that the Covenanters were circumvented by the English Parliament and were drawn into a league with men who meant only to employ them for their own purposes, and that either did cast them off or subdue them beneath a sterner, away, sterner sway than that of Charles. Were it even so, it might prove the treachery of the English, but would expose the Covenanters to no heavier accusation than that of unsuspecting simplicity of mind. They ought to have first ascertained, men say, what form of church government England intended to adopt before they had consented to the League. And yet, the same accusers fiercely condemned the Scotch, Scottish Covenanters for attempting to force their own Presbyterian forms upon the people of English. The former accusation manifestly destroys the latter. That the Covenanters did not attempt to force Presbyterianism upon England is proved by the fact that they entered into the League without any such specific stipulation. 
and they sought no such stipulation because it was contrary to their principles either to, to submit or force in matters of religion or attempt to use force against other free Christian men. It argues, therefore, ignorance both of their principles and of their conduct to bring against them an accusation so groundless and so base. They consented to lend their aid to England in a day of peril, in which peril they were themselves involved. But they left to England's assembled divines the grave and responsible task of reforming their own church, leading merely as they were required the assistance of some of their own most learned, pious, and experienced ministers to promote the great and holy enterprise. For that they have been they have been and they will be blamed by witlings, skylists, and infidel philosophers. But what England's best and greatest men sought with earnest desire and received with respect and gratitude, Scotland need never be ashamed that her venerable covenanted fathers did not decline to grant. End of quote. And now I'd like to add the Westminster Standards had an entire section on church government, which was supposed to be implemented by the English church. This was not possible due to the treachery of Oliver Cromwell and, the, and uh, the people that surrounded him. Well, let's look now at the Psalm League and Covenant. It's worth examining. It's a crucial document. Uh, let us look first at the title and each section of the Psalm League and Covenant in turn. So we'll look at this for the rest of today. Here's the title. Now keep in mind, this has been amended after 1650 to include some other things. The Solemn League and Covenant for Reformation and Defense of Religion, the Honor and Happiness of the King, and the Peace and Safety of the Three Kingdoms of Scotland, England, and Ireland, agreed upon by commissioners from the Parliament and Assembly of Divines in England with commissioners of the Convention of Estates and General Assembly in Scotland, approved by the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland and by both Houses of Parliament and Assembly of Divines in England, and taken and subscribed by then, Anno, 643, and thereafter by said authority, taken and subscribed by all ranks in Scotland and England the same year, and ratified by an act of Parliament of Scotland, Anno 1644, and again renewed in Scotland with an acknowledgement of sins and engagement to duties, by all ranks, Anno 1648, and by Parliament, 1649, and taken and subscribed by King Charles II at Spy, at Spey, June 28, 1650, and at Schoon, J January the 1st, 1651. That's the title. The title tells us what the document is, its purpose, who has subscribed the document, and when. Very detailed. The expression Solemn League and Covenant tells us that it is a civil and a religious document. It applies to the church. It applies to the state. Number one, its purpose. It, it, its purpose is the reformation and defense of religion. That is the true Christian religion the honor and happiness of the king, and the peace and safety of the three kingdoms. It is quite clear that the chief purpose is reformation and defense of religion, which will result in the honor and happiness of the king. The presupposition here, which is totally biblical, is that a false and corrupt religion will lead to a corrupt civil magistrate. A corrupt civil magistrate will result in decline and covenant sanctions by God. You want happiness, you want peace, you want prosperity, you've got to have the true religion. You've got to have a magistrate that follows the true religion, and that, of course, brings blessings. Moreover, a non-reformed religion and a corrupt civil magistrate will lead to calamity and God's sanctions on that particular nation or nations. Thus, we see that even the title is rich in biblical wisdom. Now, Americans have been taught neutrality in religion and pluralism. But there can be no neutrality. You have a wicked leader like Obama. You have a wicked leader like Hillary Clinton, who's totally satanic to the very core, who believes in murdering babies, in statism, in socialism. I guarantee you that our nation will suffer. Number two, it was subscribed by the civil magistrates and the religious leaders in both England and Scotland. Ireland, at the time being under darkness, is not even mentioned as subscribing. It was under the darkness of Roman Catholicism. It was subscribed by both church and state in England and Scotland. The Scottish ministers originally did not want to include Ireland, but the English insisted because it was under England's authority. The Scots apparently left it in the hands of the British to work toward reformation in Ireland. You want to include Ireland? That's fine. Take it away, guys. Do your best. And Ireland to this day is in darkness, except for pockets in Northern Ireland. <coughs> 
renewal dates are listed, and the fact that Charles II swore the covenant twice is noted. The title was obviously amended after the 1640s. It is also noted that it was taken and subscribed by all ranks of persons in Scotland and England the same year. This covenant is a perfect reflection of the national covenants taken in times of Reformation in Judah. The contents are based directly on the teachings of Scripture. It was a true reformation of religion that led to the covenant. It was sworn by the civil magistrate, the church, and the people, just like in the Bible. Just like in the Bible. One may question the motive and the sincerity of some of the British, but one cannot question the fact that procedurally, structurally, and as regards the content, we have a thoroughly biblical, lawful, and thus binding covenant. It's excellent. It's outstanding. Every Christian should love it. Anyone familiar with the Bible will recognize immediately that it was deliberately patterned after the biblical covenanting. Now let's look at the introduction. That was, that was the title. Let's look at the introduction. We, noblemen, barons, knights, gentlemen, citizens, burgesses, ministers of the gospel, and commons of all sorts in the kingdoms of Scotland, England, and Ireland by the providence of God, living under one king, and being of one reformed religion, having before our eyes the glory of God and the advancement of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the honor and happiness of the king's majesty and his posterity, the true public liberty, safety, and peace of the kingdoms, wherein everyone's private condition is included, and calling to mind the treacherous and bloody plots, conspiracies, attempts, and practices of the enemies of God against the true religion and professors thereof in all places, especially in these three kingdoms, ever since the reformation of religion, and how much their rage, power, and presumption are of late, and at this time increased in exercise, whereof the deplorable state of the church and kingdom of Ireland, the distressed state of the church and kingdom of England, and the dangerous state of the church and kingdom of Scotland are present in public testimonies. We have now at last, after other means of <clears throat> supplication, remonstrance, protestation, and sufferings, for the preservation of ourselves and our religion from utter ruin and destruction, according to the commendable practice of these kingdoms in former times and the example of God's people in other nations, after mature deliberation, resolved and determined to enter into a mutual and solemn league and covenant, wherein we all subscribe, and each one us of us for himself and with our hands lifted up to the Most High God do swear. Okay, that's the introduction. In the introductory paragraph, we have a number of things noted. Number one, the who. From the top to the bottom of society, politically and socially, everyone is swearing to the covenant. That's the who. Number two, the providential situation is noted and the reason and purpose of this covenant is stated once again. When God providentially gives a people the opportunity to make a nation explicitly Christian, we must never pass up that opportunity. The Christians in the United States failed their duty in the 1700s, and we're paying the price now. There were establishments in various states, but there wasn't a federal establishment. And that's even, that's critical. And they failed, and we're suffering the consequences today. Number three, the reason this covenant is needed is noted. There are many strong enemies of the true religion, and the church needs reformation. The covenant, if faithfully kept, will preserve ourselves and religion for, from utter destruction. How can you stop the enemies of the true religion if you give them equal rights and liberties? You cannot. Number four, the mutual psalm league and covenant is sworn to with hands lifted up to God. Let's look at numbers one to four. The religious heart of the covenant is found in numbers one to four. And this, is, of course, is penned by Alexander Henderson. Number one is positive. Number two is negative. Number three is positive. Number four is negative. The Pauline dynamic of sanctification is followed, but applied corporately. Here's number one. That we shall sincerely, really, and constantly, through the grace of God, endeavor in our several places and callings, the preservation of the Reformed religion in the Church of Scotland in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government, against our common enemies, 
the reformation of religion in the kingdoms of Ireland and England, excuse me, of England and Ireland, in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government according to the word of God and the example of the best reformed churches, and shall endeavor to bring the churches of God in the three kingdoms to the nearest conjunction in uniformity in religion, confession of faith, form of church government, directory for worship and catechizing, that we and our posterity after us may, as brethren live in faith and love, and the Lord may delight to dwell in the midst of us. Okay, the end of quote, that's number one. In this positive statement, we note the following. Number one, everyone, no matter what they're calling, can swear this covenant as long as they are sincere, they really believe it, and they promise to carry it through to the best of their ability. It doesn't matter whether you're the president or a plumber or a sheep herder or a scholar. You can swear the covenant and you can contribute to reformation. Number two, the covenant involves a thorough, comprehensive reformation of doctrine, worship, discipline, and government, according to the word of God. This alone rules out a kind of pluralism where Arminianism, various heresies, corruptions in worship, and perversions of discipline and government are tolerated for the sake of the false concept of growth and unity. Now remember, covenanting does not add any content to what scripture already teaches, but binds one tightly and strictly by the superadded obligation of an oath to what scripture already requires. That's all a covenant it is. That's why when people say, oh, well, that covenant doesn't apply to me. Well, it does apply to you because it taught, comes directly from scripture. One of the reasons that the old Presbyterian covenants are ignored today and the thoroughly biblical ordinance of covenanting is rejected and even maligned today is the sad fact that most of modern conservative Presbyterianism has adopted, and let me just say, people malign covenanting all the time today, and most of the people that I've heard malign it know nothing about it, they've never studied it, they don't know anything about it, and they're, they're ripping it. If they, maybe if they studied it and learned what it really was, maybe they wouldn't be so quick to condemn it. But anyway, Modern conservative Presbyterianism has adopted a pragmatism over a strict biblicism. Pragmatism. Pragmatism. It's the enemy of biblicism. B. Pluralism over a full and faithful subscriptionism. That is, men are licensed to preach and ordain to the ministry who reject several important biblical doctrines and practices. Six-day creationism. The regular principle of worship and its proper, sound, consistent, sincere application to public worship. Justification by faith alone, the proper meaning and application of the sacraments, etc., etc. C. A false ecumenicalism in the keeping of the status quo over a biblical concept of testimony bearing. That is, instead of fervently adhering to and maintaining all the previous attainments of the Reformation, which is our duty, according to the scripture and our covenants, modern churchmen see their job as one of justifying accumulated human traditions, declension and errors in doctrine, worship, and discipline. Consequently, it is usually the true Presbyterians who are attacked and persecuted, not the errorists. And uh, there's all these discussion groups on the internet. You know, the Puritan this, the Puritan that, Puritan this. And uh, my experience is that they always kick true Puritans off those sites because they want to be pluralistic and pragmatic. If you've been wondering why conservatives usually get the short end of the stick in modern corrupt Presbyterian churches, it is because there can be no neutrality. Pragmatism and biblicism do not mix. If Presbyterians accept John Frame's pre-Latical Romanist rejection of the regular principle, then they will think that the true covenanters are deluded fanatics that need to be suppressed. You can't have intellectual pure, uh, or doctrinal pluralism or in practice. It doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. People who strictly adhere to the standards in scripture are persecuted because they're not willing to compromise. They're not willing to be pluralistic. And then three, they are to look to the word of God in the best reformed churches. In other words, when Reformation has occurred in conjunction with the word of God and truth is displaced error, the church does not need to reinvent the wheel. 
This is not a rejection of sola scriptura, for the inspired word of God is the standard that determines what are the best Reformed churches. How do you know what's the best Reformed church? Well, you, have, you could prove it through, through scripture. The expression of the best Reformed churches is not defined, but given the uh, progress of Reformation in Scotland, we can assume that the Scottish church is certainly included. And I would say at that time, they were the best Reformed churches were in Scotland. In the first Reformation, the Scots looked to the best Reformed churches on the continent. Here, in the second Reformation, we could say that the Scottish church has surpassed many Dutch and German Reformed churches in Reformation. Therefore, the Scottish church must be imitated. Number four, a major goal of the covenant is to establish uniformity in religion. Confession of faith, doctrinal unity, form of church government, biblical Presbyterianism, unity of government, directory for public worship. That is the worship of the Puritans and Presbyterians as opposed to prelatical and Roman Catholic worship. And catechizing. The Solemn League and Covenant produced the Westminster Standards in order to fulfill this goal of uniformity. We don't achieve uniformity by simply uh, saying, well, we're going to follow this human tradition, this proper historical line. We have uniformity by having detailed doctrinal statements on worship, practice, the sacraments, doctrine, etc., and coming to agreement in doctrine. If you say, if you posit an artificial, well, we follow the proper historical line, that doesn't solve any problems because you still must have doctrinal unity to maintain true unity. And if you don't have doctrinal unity or unity in practice, you won't have unity, no matter what historical line you posit. Given the widespread rejection of strict or full subscriptionism today, not based on finding errors in the standards, but on the acceptance of pluralism and pragmatism for a pretended unity, this biblical goal is largely rejected today. The attitude is, well, things are getting worse. Why even try to have uniformity? We shouldn't even try. We should just have a nice pluralism. Big mistake. We don't say, well, you know, nobody's going to be perfectly sanctified in this life. We shouldn't try to be perfectly sanctified. Nobody says that. Well, we should try to have perfect uniformity. We should, we should really try. If there are minor areas of the standards that could be clarified or improved, for example, the office of doctor or teacher, then churches should amend those areas or add a footnote for clarification. But to practice a very loose subscriptionism is not honest and leads to declension. I would have more respect for these little, quote, conservative denominations that are Presbyterian that if they just simply said, well, we don't really believe in six-day creationism, here's what we believe, but they don't do that. They pretend they're strict <laughs> confessionalists, and they're not. Be honest. If you don't believe it, don't say you believe it. Number five, the covenant is for we and our posterity, so that faithfulness and covenant blessings will pass to subsequent generations. Biblical covenanting is intended not simply to establish faithfulness in the present, but also to pass that faithfulness on to future generations. It is designed not just to solidify current attainments and prevent declension, but also to keep these reformational attainments from being neglected and forgotten over time. Why is that brilliant? Why is that biblical? Because if you look at the Bible, reformation, declension, reformation, declension. The point of covenanting is to solidify the reformation. This philosophy of corporate sanctification and covenant keeping is based solely on the word of God, and must not be neglected or rejected by Presbyterians today. People have to be against covenanting today because they're against Reformation. They accept declension. They embrace declension. They justify declension. Therefore, they reject covenanting. Many of the same Presbyterians who reject Christian national covenanting fervently defend the binding authority of the U.S. Constitution on posterity. If the U.S. Constitution, which is primarily a, a right-wing enlightenment document, is binding on posterity, why could not a Christian covenant or constitution also be binding? That's what puzzles me. I know all these men, they reject covenant, but they sure are strict constructionists of the Constitution. Well, let's be strict constructionists on the covenants that, that apply to us, that were binding on posterity. 
The rejection of the abiding validity of Christian covenants over time is neither rational or biblical. It doesn't make any sense at all. Number two, Roman numeral number two of the covenant. That we in like manner, without respect of persons, endeavor to ex the extirpation of popery, prelacy, that is church government by archbishops, bishops, their chancellors, and commissioners, deans, deans and chapters, archdeacons, and all other ecclesiastical offices, depending on that hierarchy. Superstition, heresy, schism, profaneness, and whatever shall not be, be found to be contrary to sound doctrine and the power of godliness, lest we partake in other men's sins, and thereby be in danger to receive, receive of their plagues, and that the Lord may be one, and his name one in the three kingdoms. In Roman numeral two, we have a negative duty, which begins with the general statement, the extirpation of popery and prelacy. Now, the word extirpate means the complete eradication of popery and prelacy, root, stem, and branch. The things to be eradicated are then specifically noted. Number one, all prelatical church offices and the positions connected to these offices. This makes perfect sense because the Bible teaches Presbyterian church government. You got elders, teaching and ruling elders, or ministers and elders, and deacons. That's it. You don't have bishops, archbishops, and all that kind of stuff. The additions of Rome continued with minor, uh, with minor changes by Episcopalians are human traditions. Therefore, they are without divine warrant and sinful. They must be rejected and eliminated. Number two, we must extirpate superstition. This means all religious practices that are based on human traditions. Calvin would say, and he says it frequently, that practices that originate in the mind of man, not the word of God, they're superstitions. If we study the writings of the Presbyterians and Puritans of this time, it would include things like Christmas and the use of the church calendar. In Scotland and Puritan New England, Christmas was a civil crime. You would be arrested. If you did it, the church would discipline you. And if you refused to repent, you would be excommunicated. Think about that, you Christmas celebrators in Presbyterian circles. It would also include the use of musical instruments in public worship. Number three. Heresy is listed, which includes Arminianism, Romanism, and things like premillennialism. Number four, schism indicates a desire to eliminate unlawful sects, such as the Quakers. They would also be covered under heresy. Number five, profaneness means open violations of the moral law. Things like blasphemy, Sabbath breaking, idolatry. Six, contains a catch-all. Anything contrary to sound doctrine and the power of godliness. And then there are three reasons given for these negative duties. Number one, to tolerate such things and not deal with them biblically by church discipline and civil punishments when appropriate is to partake in other men's sins. This point is a strong condemnation of most of modern conservative Presbyterianism, which tolerates Christmas, Easter, Arminianism, Denials of six-day creationism, the federal vision heresy, or the denial of justification by faith alone. Uh, it tolerates modern church, modern Presbyterianism, tolerates high church liturgy, liturgies, Arminian or will worship, remarriage of guilty parties, Sabbath desecration, etc., etc. The modern rejection of covenanting Puritanism and early Presbyterianism, which is based on scripture, not pragmatism, can be seen in the modern conservative Dutch and Presbyterian organization called NAPARC, N-A-P-A-R-C. The stated purpose of NAPARC sounds good, which is for the conservative Dutch Reformed and Presbyterian groups to work together towards unity of doctrine, worship, and practice. The great problem of NAPARC is that it sets up a, a system of fraternal relations before true unity has been achieved and thus accepts doctrinal, uh, doctrinal corruption and worship corruptions, and a form of pluralism at the outset. Member denominations agree to each other's serving each other communion, recognizing discipline of each other's group, to not plant a church in a member's backyard, and they agree to exchange pulpits before unity has occurred. 
or been achieved. Communion is thus served to those who practice the Romanist or Episcopal Church calendar, have rock bands, practice Pado Communion, teach the Federal Vision, have high church liturgies, James Jordan, Peter Lightheart, etc., deny the biblical doctrine of creation, use musical instruments, which is Romanist, teach sacramentalism, have completely corrupt worship with rock bands and all that, such as John Frame teaches. This organization has existed since the late 1970s and has not brought any unity at all. They have not progressed one inch toward unity. And why should they? They already have fraternal relations and they already accept each other's communion, serve each other's communion. What's the point of having unity when you treat each other as though you're already united when you're not? Why should it? Why should it uh, progress toward unity when, it, when corruptions, covenant-breaking, declension, and prelatical Romanist worship is accepted at the outset? The only way to truly achieve unity is to adhere to the truth and work to completely extirpate false doctrine and worship and practice. This involves imitation of the Reformations in Scripture and imitating the early Presbyterians and Puritans who taught against, condemned, and disciplined false doctrine, false worship, corrupt worship, and practice. NAPARC is a hypocritical, covenant-breaking organization that has achieved nothing in 40 years. It's basically a little club. They get together. They don't really debate. They don't really uh, condemn false doctrine. It also contradicts the fact that there can be no neutrality. Now, I want you to call Joel Beakey and ask him if his denomination will take a truly Puritan church that rejects holy days in worship. And the answer will very likely be no. It is required. So there's a pretended neutrality, but there's not really a new, there's not, there's a pretended unity, but there's not really unity. Because unity must be based on unity of doctrine, unity of worship, unity of government. If we accept pluralism and tolerate open, constitutional, serious errors, then we participate in their errors. We participate in their covenant breaking. Am I saying that a denomination must be perfect to be a lawfully constituted church? No, not at all. I'm not saying that. But it should keep its covenants, its attainments, its testimony. If it does not, then it is backsliding. If we do not treat truth as truth, but merely as flexible options, there will be no reformation. How can there be? So the covenant teaches us, the Psalm League and Covenant teaches us that we can't have neutrality and we can't tolerate corruption and we can't have a pretended unity. We must have a true unity based on clear statements of, un of doctrine and worship and so forth. And then number two, to avoid the danger of covenant sanctions that will come, ca that will cause a nation to be punished, um, the covenants must be adopted to avoid the punishment uh, of nations that tolerate such sins. Many modern Presbyterians reject the idea of God sending judgment upon nations in the New Covenant era, but such thinking is dispensational and is easily disproved. The United States and Canada will suffer judgment if they do not repent. I guarantee it. And I can guarantee it because the Bible guarantees it. You spit in the face of God by murdering infants and by uh, electing as president a habitual liar who believes it's okay to murder babies and suck out their brains and chop them into little pieces and throw them in a dumpster, you're going to be judged. Number three, that the Lord may be one and his name one in the three kingdoms. This means the acceptance of the true and living God in all three kingdoms. This presupposes reformation and the rejection of idolatry and profaneness. So, we, we've run out of time. We'll stop there. We'll, we'll look at number three and following next week. We'll, we'll continue. Why go through this? Why go through the Psalm, League, and Covenant? Well, A, it still applies to us. We're Presbyterians. It's a binding covenant. It's a biblical covenant. It's binding. It's binding on posterity. It applies to us. We need to learn, know what it says. And B, it's fantastic. It's biblical. It's excellent. This is what Presbyterianism needs to go back to. This is what we need to do to have reformation. Learn from it. Don't shun it. Don't 
condemn it when you don't know anything about covenanting. Listen to it. Listen to what it has to say. It's great. It's way better than what's being taught today by the majority of Presbyterians. So we'll continue this next week. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have achieved such a great reformation. We know you've done it in the past. We know you can do it again. We pray for revival among Reformed churches, that they would return to what they used to be. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to work for, toward true unity based on the truth of Scripture and the attainments of the Reformation. We thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.